How many of you can say this morning that you need to hear a word from the Lord? Amen. Father, our hearts are open to you for what you desire to say to us beyond what you have already spoken. We pray that our hearts would be not only sensitive to you, but that you would grant us understanding in the revelation of who you are. Illumine us, enlighten us, expose us even more to what you have for us, but most importantly, who you are in us. We delight in knowing you. We delight in serving you. We delight in lifting up our hands. We delight, oh God, in being obedient, following through with the commitments that we've made to you. Let your will be done in us as there amongst angels, in every place and in every way. In Jesus' name, we count it done. And everyone said, Amen. There are many stories or many narratives in the world today about various philosophies and religions and people and movements. And it's no shock at all that we live in a world that is very me-centered, where people live according to their own individual understanding of truth. And in many ways, reject any such thing as an objective, universal, fixed, uniform truth that applies to everyone. But the task that God has given to every one of us who are believers in Jesus is to proclaim that he is that universal truth that everyone needs to be exposed to and needs a relationship with. This morning, I come before you to say a little bit more about that truth that God has made known. As we turn our attention to what God has for us in this hour and this time, I want to thank you for taking the time, either online or gathering here in this room, to separate out, carve out some time, to just spend time with God and with one another. I want to continue what the Lord has given to me to minister on today. We've had a really action-packed weekend, and God has spoken in a very rich way. I understand yesterday was very, very powerful, and I, I wish I could have been. I just wasn't able to make it, but very powerful as the Lord used a young woman to share a testimony uh, from uh, Zambia, and one of the ministries that we've been blessed to be able to support and be a part of. And I just pray that each one of us here will be helped by the Holy Spirit to really find our place in the will of God and to get in there and to do it with all of our heart. Everybody isn't called uh, individually to do the same thing. Everything that's going on here, you may miss a few things here and there, but they're all designed for one will, one reason, and that's to bring glory to God, yes, but to bring glory to God in a particular way that you and I would give our lives completely over to what God has. And so uh, throughout this time, as we end this year, we're now in these 10 days of all coming near the end of it. For those of you that are familiar with what the Bible calls the Feast of the Lord or the Moadim of God, the seasons of God, that's really where we are. Rosh Hashanah speaks of the head of the year for the nation of Israel. 10 days later is the Day of Atonement, a time of national repentance. It's the only mandatory fast for the nation of Israel. And so some will be engaging in that as we reflect upon not only our sin, but our need for the one and only true Messiah in honoring him and all that he's called us to do and to be. But during this season, God has been uh, speaking to my heart as well. And I will not be teaching on that this morning, but I pray that uh, over the course of this time that we will have together in the word, that any pulls that the Holy Spirit places on your heart, anything that he puts his hand on, that he wants us to turn from, that he wants us to repent of, that we'll be obedient to the Lord. Sometimes repentance gets a bad rap, you know, and maybe that's because of the way it's been presented by some of us in leadership in the church, or maybe others, maybe not in leadership, but in the church. Uh, but the word simply means to change the mind, uh, to turn, and to move in the direction that God now wants us to go. 
It was used as a military term at times. Not just go any direction, but to go in the direction that you're commanded to go. But when we do that, that's where we really do discover the freedom that our hearts long for, the peace, the security, the joy, the sense of wholeness that we all crave. It's found in repentance. The Bible says it also that uh, it's, it's through repentance that we'll discover times of refreshing. God will do refreshing things in your life and in my life. And so never be uh, a person that assumes that repentance is just something you did to get saved. That's true, we did do that. Repent and believe the gospel of the kingdom in that way. But repentance is a way of life. It really is, it's a way of life. We're not repenting always to get saved, but we are repenting to grow, to expand, to develop, to be stabilized, to move forward, to prosper. There has to be changes. There has to be changes in our thinking, changes in our behavior to move forward in the will of God. And so. I encourage you to do that. Many, many centuries ago, in the first century, God raised up a man by the name of Paul to be one of his apostles. In the New Testament, he wrote 13 of the letters that are there. One of them is written to a church that really got birthed uh, under the ministry of the Holy Spirit through him and the team that was with him. Luke writes that when they even received, when he even received direction to go uh, to that to place to minister, uh, Paul was trying to go somewhere else. And the Lord redirected him from a human standpoint, but it was always the plan of God that he be there. And Paul was obedient and went, and mighty ministry took place. And the Word of God uh, tells us now that he's writing back to this church around the year eight. A.D. 62, and uh, he's in prison in Rome. He's being uh, held there, at least in their minds, as an insurrectionist, as a person who's guilty of treason, for he's declared that uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, which is the Jewish pronunciation of Jesus the Messiah, is in fact the one and only Kyrios. He is the Lord. That the real Lord is not Caesar or Kaiser, the real Lord is Yeshua, Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth. And so he's being held there. He's writing back to this church because they have been supporting him. They're not really a, a very wealthy group of people, but they literally, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, they gave of themselves. They gave money and they gave things like that, but they also gave of themselves for this ministry. So this is a congregation that has become very endeared to him. He loves them, and he has uh, been writing to them, or he's writing to them in this particular letter to encourage them to live lives that are worthy of the gospel. Uh, one of the themes of the book is to, is to live lives in the joy of the Lord, despite his suffering and despite their suffering. And I want to continue with what God gave me as it relates to this. We're just dealing with one prayer, we call it an apostolic prayer because he was an apostle who prayed it. But it was a prayer that was inspired, I believe, by the Holy Spirit. And uh, Paul actually wrote a portion of the prayer down. I'm sure this isn't everything he prayed for them, but he wrote a part of it down. This uh, teaching is today is continuing uh, from last week. I'm calling it healthy submission and loving excellently. And really the point is to show the relationship of healthy submission to our theme for the year, and that is uh, loving and living excellently for His Excellency, uh, who is Christ Jesus. So let's read the verse again, these verses again together. Chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, if you'll turn the slide so we can read it together, you'll see it there. Let's read it. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. Okay, you'll see next that there are at least four directives 
and I want to add expectations uh, that the Lord is expressing through the apostle through this prayer. The first one is that they would excel. He uses the word abound. It means to surpass, go beyond where they presently are in their understanding and their walk and the love of God. The second one is that they would approve, approve the excellent thing. The third one is that they would be in the best condition possible, sincere and blameless with the fruit of righteousness in their lives when the Lord returns, not barely holding on to see what the end's going to be as some have suggested through some of our music in more recent times, but to be in the best condition possible, to be mature believers. And then fourthly, they are to be uh, and present fruit that glorifies God. You know that when we talk about this first thing, to excel in love, let's go ahead uh, to the next slide. There are five ways to excel in God's love through experiential knowledge. Paul prayed that they would excel in his love through experiential knowledge and through all discernment. The word experiential knowledge or the phrase is a translation of the word simply rendered knowledge there in, first, uh, in, in the first chapter of verse 9. It's the word epinosis. And it speaks of knowledge that we get, understanding that we get when we apply what we know. So it's knowledge at a deeper level. It's kind of like uh, sitting down, uh, hearing someone or reading about what it actually is like to jump off of a 50-foot diving board. Uh, you get a certain sense of knowledge. The person writes it down and you understand their body will tremble and the velocity and the speed at which they're traveling. And then there's another deeper level of knowledge that you get when you go get on the high diving board and you jump off. One knowledge is theoretical. The other knowledge is experiential. And then you can begin to try to match what you thought you understood in theory with what you actually experience when you do it. That's the difference between someone who is religious and someone who gets saved. That's the difference between someone who believes that God exists and tries to honor him that way through, by speaking well of him and someone who is born again. There's a difference. There's a big difference. One speaks of it conceptually, theoretically. The other person enters into a relationship with God and is supernaturally changed on the inside. That's not something you can think up religiously. That's not something that happens to you because you decide to live by the moral code that the Bible tells us to live by. No, that happens one way, the repentance and believing the gospel and putting my life in his hands. There is a spiritual transformation that takes place when that happens. If that doesn't happen in the heart, the only thing that happens is we end up like the demons who believe and tremble at his name. You see the difference? One is theoretical. The other one is experiential. And so here are five ways that we experientially, we gain experiential knowledge in the love of God through instruction and obedience to the word of God. Secondly, through the strengthening of the inner man or the hidden man of the heart, the Bible calls it sometimes, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And thirdly, uh, through the intercession of godly leaders. We walk through all of this, so I, I won't uh, yield to the temptation to teach it again. But the intercession of godly leaders is instrumental, very instrumental and influential in you and I experiencing the love of God and gaining a greater knowledge of the love of God. Uh, it's very important. If you haven't uh, heard that teaching, I encourage you to go back and find it. It's online at our website. You can find it and you can kind of walk through it very clearly. There are certain things that did not happen in your home in the realm of intercession on the part of your parents. And because of it, you were not exposed to certain ministries of the Holy Spirit. There were certain things your mom or your dad or your guardian, your uncle, your cousin, your grandma, or your grandpa didn't know to do. 
and the ignorance still cost you. So when a leader intercedes for the people of God, there are manifestations of God's presence and his love that we get, that we get exposed to that we normally wouldn't. My people perish because they lack revelation knowledge. Yeah. This is, this is so important. So when we think in terms of what God has called us to, what he's called us for, that's the idea. The intercession of godly leaders, and this that we just read today, these three verses, is an intercessory prayer. It's not just a nice set of words. It's a prayer of intercession for a group of people. It's very important. This I pray. This I pray. And I'm praying for you, Paul says, right? And even in Ephesians chapter 3, where we spent quite a bit of time, it's a prayer of intercession. Prayer of intercession. Standing on behalf. And when we pray in this way, when leaders pray in this way, God does powerful things that we can connect with and we can recognize and associate with him. Because we heard it, we, it was prayed for. There was a place of agreement that a leader went into concerning uh, a people, concerning their family, concerning their neighborhood, concerning the local church, concerning uh, their city. This, this is so important. If my people who are called by my name will love themselves and pray, and my people seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will uh, hear from heaven, God says. God says he would hear from heaven. And he would forgive the sin of his people, and he would heal the land. But if the people don't pray, and that word for prayer there is really a word, a prayer about intercession. It's not just petitioning for our own personal needs. The word of the Lord came to the nation of Israel while they were there in Babylon. Pray for the city of Babylon. Pray for it to experience uh, the welfare of God, the shalom of God. It'll happen anyway. No, it won't. Where God, many times where God doesn't find agreement, he does not do anything. Now, there's some who think God doesn't do anything no matter what, if there is no agreement. No, some things God does whether you agree with him or not. My mother was not agreeing with God about her baby dying. But there are things that God does not do until we come into agreement with him about it. We suffer some things because we're ignorant, not because we're not sincere, but because we're ignorant. We don't know better. We don't know better. And leadership is, a, is key for praying. I like to use this phrase, kind of praying certain things in. Helping to, uh, to pray on behalf uh, of that. God finds in a leader's heart an agreement with him for what he's wanting to do. Shall we tell Abram what we're about to do? Genesis. Hmm? Abraham turns and he finds out what God is getting ready to do. And he enters into an exchange and in intercession with God over Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot and his family, his kinsmen being there. And the love of God gets expressed totally throughout the entire situation, yes. But concerning his, his nephew Lot, God, if you can find 50, you can find 45, you can find 40, 30. Lord, don't get upset with me. Can, can, if 10 are righteous, can we? Hmm? Intercession. Some stuff God doesn't do because there are people that will not come into agreement with God. Why is agreement with God so important? Because when God does it, he wants to work through people that are in symphony with him, in harmony with him. We don't just let the ball drop. It doesn't make any difference whether God ministers in St. Louis or not, whether he drops, stops the drive-bys or not. It doesn't make any difference whether or not the churches are filled. It doesn't make any difference. Just do your thing. No, no. 
There are certain things that do not happen in your marriage, do not happen in your family, do not happen, will not happen where there's ignorance and a refusal to come into agreement with God about what he's getting ready to do. When Israel was being prepared to move into the land or move in, even in the land to another area, God often stopped them and said, take a day or two, take three days, get prepared for this. Where I'm taking you, you need to be prepared for it. It doesn't just happen. Remember Moses tried to get them to go? The first generation, they didn't want to go. They were not in agreement with God about it. God didn't make them go. He didn't give them the land anyway. Moses prayed. No, no, it can't. Yeah, this is important. All right. So submission is directly connected. I'll, I'll go on and get to that, to this. All of this is important. So that's the third way we gain experience and knowledge. The intercession of godly leaders and personal intimacy with God and other believer disciples and then submission to wise shepherding and fifthly, prudent behavior. Okay, we're going to get as far as we can today and this time and we'll stop. Health and submission to wise shepherding then. Uh, there are three questions that we're trying to answer. And so far we've gotten into question number two. But the first one is, what is wise shepherding? Second one is, what is healthy submission? Because if submission uh, to wise shepherding and not just, we talked a lot about the shepherd himself, Jesus, but shepherding is a very important thing in your my life. A shepherd was a person, typically a man, who had the responsibility of caring for sheep or for livestock. Um, the Bible uses the term shepherd as a verb and not just as a noun often. And so it, it involved pasturing sheep, taking them out to graze them, looking around, making sure that they were properly cared for. Um, when you think of shepherd, think of care and inspection and protection and guidance, finding the right place for them to be watered and to drink and so forth and lay down and graze and all of that. And then they, they had the responsibility of feeding the sheep and then going to get the sheep. <laughs> if, the, if the sheep wandered off or a sheep kind of fell down into a ravine or something, uh, it was the shepherd's responsibility to risk his life to get the sheep. And they had to find ways to do that. I've read of, of, uh, of one shepherd technique that would happen if a, if a sheep kept wandering off, particularly the younger ones. They would, they would go and get them and gently break one of their limbs and rebind it and carry them around with them so they can get used to the shepherd's voice and not wander off. Yeah, this shepherding is, is very important for sheep, extremely important. And so it is for people. So it is for people. God's people are often, we're referred to as the flock of God, God's people. So what is wise shepherding? What is healthy submission? And we won't get to this today. What are the purposes and benefits of submission to wise shepherds? Let's go on. Uh, again, just to repeat, who are wise shepherds? Philippians chapter 1, Paul mentions it, gives us a picture of what they look like. He says this, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints, that's the holy ones or the separated ones in Christ Jesus. Saints are not perfect in and of themselves or of ourselves. The word simply means a holy one or one separated unto God in Christ Jesus, who are in Philippi, with the bishops, some argue for that that's a bad translation. It could be just simply overseers and deacons or servants. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So God appointed feeders, that's what a shepherd does, and caretakers. Scripture uh, is very distinct on this. And in, unless sometimes you can study the language out or at least look up the words, the dictionary, you don't see the difference. But the, the difference is there. Even when, when Peter uh, was responding to those three questions of Jesus, uh, these two words appear, feed and shepherd. Okay? Feed and shepherd, and then feed again. 
Uh, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me more than these? More than these what? These fishermen. These fish. Because he's a fisherman. You love me more than your livelihood? Yes, Lord, I love you. Shepherd my sheep. It's the next word. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know all things. Feed my sheep. Hmm? Feed my lambs. Shepherd my sheep. Feed my older sheep. It's there in the word of God. Shepherd had a great responsibility to feed. I shall raise up, I shall give you pastors after my own heart that shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Millions and millions and millions of ideas and concepts and philosophies and views and values for centuries and millennia has been amongst humankind. And God has elected not to chosen not to speak out of the sky. He's chosen not to do it that way. Could. Why don't God just open up the sky and just say, hey, I'm God, I want everybody to listen. No, that's not how he does it. He leaves us here as the people of God and he raises up shepherds. Feed us. Sheep, I told you, I think last week, sheep eat about six to eight times a day. And so it's, it's important. Where are you feeding and who's feeding? Who's feeding you? Not just where are you eating, who's feeding you? There's nothing that could probably wreck a relationship of any kind more than people eating from two or three or four, five, eight, 10, 15 different places. I, I know it's our choice where we choose to eat and feed and all that, even in the natural, but I'm telling you, it can create a problem spiritually. And it usually does. Nobody's intending for it to be that way, but that's usually what happens. Because whoever's feeding you has a certain emphasis. I don't mean this negatively. I mean, even from God. They're living within a certain time frame, within a certain period. Jeremiah lived at a time that was different from Moses. And so what God gave Jeremiah to feed to people was different from what God gave Moses to feed to people. And all the others that were there. This is, this is, this is just... Christianity 101, church 101, okay? Internet and uh, TV and platforms and, you know, you sound like pastors again. I'm not against it. I'm just simply saying you, we need to understand that it has a certain impact on us when it comes time for walking together. This person's coming from here. This person's got this emphasis. This person's got this priority. This person has this interpretation of things. This person has, and which is cool. Wonderful. If we can come together and meet together and discuss it and really see whether or not we're all on the same page. Very, very important. You know, they don't really want to do, they don't want, they don't want to obey God. They don't want to obey God. It has a lot to do with where you're feeding and who's feeding you, who you're trusting to feed you. Most people love TV preachers and those kind of folk because they don't know you. Right? You send them money and they're not there. They don't see that you don't pray. They don't know you don't really see God. They know you give them money. Okay, Pastor Ray, you're meddling now. All right, but this, this is important. Uh, Y'all know I'm not against ministries that do it. I, I did it. We do it. But you, you, can't, you can't feed here, feed here, feed here, and roll down the road here and there. I didn't get up here to say this. But do, do you, you can't do it. And everybody have the same diet and everybody would have come out being of the same mind. Amen. Moving together and flowing in God. Often what's destroying, often what's eating away, and many marriages, when, when, when different sisters get married here and your husband go to another church, I say, go, go. Hate to lose you. Bye. Yeah. Unless y'all got agreement or something. There's a vision over there. There's a vision over here. We calling on you for this, they calling on him or her for that. Okay, Pastor Ray, you done messed it up now, so.
It's really true, folks. It really is. You know, we kind of, we kind of, we got a Burger King mentality when it comes to church. We want it our way, right? And, and there's room for some of that, but not most of it. There's room for some of it, but not most of it. And that's, that's hard. It's hard for me to be the person sometimes to have to say that because it seems self-serving. You know, I get a salary from here and all of that, and so it, it's, it's self-serving. I want you here so you can bring your money so I can make sure I can pay my personal bills. That's not what this is about. If I was not the senior pastor of the church, in the, in the role that I have, I'd be teaching the same thing. It's the very same. There must be an understanding of what God's really saying and how he wants us to operate and how we flow together. Can two walk together except they be agreed? How do we come to agreement? Because it makes sense to me. It's what I always felt it meant in the first place. I don't see nothing wrong with it. No, that's not how we come into agreement. We come into agreement based upon what the scriptures say, yes, but we also come into agreement based upon what the scriptures mean. Sometimes what the scripture says uh, doesn't really communicate, listen to this, what it means. So you got to study it a little bit more to get to the meaning that's behind what it says. And, and a whole lot of internet stuff Okay. It just don't do that, y'all. I'm just, I'm just being honest with you, okay? I'm just being honest with you. It doesn't do it. And so there's often a jagged, rough flow. We're on the same page, but we're not on the same line. And we don't mean the same thing by the same line we are on. This is, this is really part of the, uh, the issue. So the, the feeding with knowledge and understanding is important in the role of a shepherd. A shepherd has to uh, really be uh, the type of individual that is willing to be corrected and acknowledge where he or she is wrong, uh, but also has to be the type of individual that can help uh, other persons discern and learn how to, to come into agreement with what God is saying. Can't be self-serving and do this. And the feeding and the caretaking go together for God's people. Okay. Uh, let's look then at, uh, we, when we, we see Jesus then, go to the next slide, please. Uh, I, I want to, yeah, I'm sorry, go back. Go back, please, I'm sorry. Next one. Next one. No, 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 the other way. Oh, we just, we just missed something. Okay, go to the next slide. There we go, all right. I told you to move too quick. And so in healthy submission, we see that Jesus Christ is the perfect example. That's where we ended last week, remember? Of what it means to submit. He's also the perfect example of what it means to be uh, the wise shepherd. Christians, and we're gonna look at some examples from scripture today on Christians, though we're imperfect, uh, we are de can be devoted examples of what God is calling for in this area. And then if we have time, we're going to take a look at some traits and, and some common traits and some common results of healthy uh, submission to God. Okay? Let's go on. Again, what is submission? Basic definition of the word submission is the action or fact of accepting or yielding to a superior force or to the will or authority of another person. That's generally in, in American and, you know, Western American, Western European language, that's basically what submission is. It's accepting or yielding to a superior force or to the will or the authority of another person. And from the, from the jump street, we used to say in the 70s, from the jump street, we don't like that. Because we, 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 we're not interested in uh, <laughs> yielding to anything that's supposed to be superior to us, right? That's, that's difficult to do, but that's what submission is. Now, let's see what it is from the, from the Bible. In the Old Testament, the word, next slide, please. In the Old Testament, the word means to humble yourself. 
And we talked about this in, in, in relationship to Hagar and, and Sarah. Uh, she ran from Sarah because Sarah was treating her harshly and she was pregnant. And uh, she, uh, the Lord, when she talked to the Lord about it, the Lord told her to go back. And he uses this word. He tells us to submit to her. To humble herself. That's what the word means. Ana. And then we find in the book of Ezra and also Daniel and other places that even when we're fasting and praying, that that's what we're doing. We're submitting. We're submitting. We're yielding to the authority of God and not just the authority of our belly. Uh, the Paul calls it, <laughs> uh, I think it's in Romans or in the Philippians, where he says that, that, that that's, you, can be, you can really fall into the trap of, of, of uh, allowing your belly to be your God. See? Isn't it interesting that when, when, when Eve and Adam sinned, that they didn't, they didn't commit what we would consider, you know, some of the big sins. They wouldn't smoke... They wasn't smoking drugs. They wasn't killing nobody. They wasn't, it, it, what, what, what did they do? What did they do? Yeah, they, they partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that was in the midst of the garden. Well, what's wrong with that? Simple. They failed to master their appetite. They failed to make their appetite come into submission to the will of God. They didn't kill nobody. They didn't cuss God out. They didn't give God the finger. Literally. Something very simple. They refused to bring their appetite in submission to the will of God. Every time you fast, that's what we're reminded to do. Bring our belly, our appetite in submission to the will of God. Because the flesh, by its very nature, is sinful. Human nature is sinful, and human nature is determined to be Lord. Everything we're seeing on the news and all that we see in the media today is ultimately about whose belly wins, whose appetites get satisfied. That's all it's about. Let me love whoever I want to love. Let me do whatever I want to do because my appetite rules. Period. And it doesn't seem to be that deadly but it's bold defiance to rise up. You see, that appetite doesn't stop with itself. That appetite takes and operates to get you to do the same thing. That's why God said to Adam, here's what you did wrong. You raised her voice above my voice. Because that's what that appetite does. It says, I will do what I crave. Even if it's in defiance of you, God. And of course, today we have the verbal manipulators and verbal engineers who tell us that God is for all of this. He's not. He's not for all of this. He loves us, but he's not for all of this. He's not. Well, he gave me, he gave me this capacity. He, gave, he made me sexual, so he must be for it. No. He made you sexual, and he gave you and me boundaries. He didn't change because that's how you feel about it or I feel about it. Minor. Adult, minor attraction, out of bounds. He didn't create that. That's the nice term for first stage pedophilia. God isn't for that. 
Did God create you with the ability to be sexually attracted? Yes, he did. He gave all of us that capacity, but he puts boundaries. Don't touch this. Don't give in to your appetite for this. It will kill you. And everything coming out of you is going to be marked with death because of it. They did it anyway. Voila, here we are. So now the verbal engineers tell us that was all myth. None of it was true. That this is really how we were created to live. That's a lie. Straight up lie. Right. So, when we fast, when we pray, when we seek God, we're not trying to impress God. You know, he's God. Hopefully, we're not trying to impress people. What we're doing is we're, we are confronting the ever pulsating, yearning, craving of the human flesh, Lee nature, to rule. And we denied for a day or two or three, sometimes 30 or 40, to spend time with God. And so the Holy Spirit conditions us to live our lives yielding to him, not to earn salvation, but so we can mature and we can grow and we can move with God. It is, it, there, there, there is a, uh, there's so much of this. Pass Ray, stop. Let's, let's go on. Yep. So the word hopotasso, that's a Greek term. The other one's a Hebrew term. It means to, to subject oneself. You, you get the idea of it being voluntary, see? To submit to one's control, to yield to one's admission or advice, absolutely. The verse can also mean to obey. It means to put myself into subjection. The other way is coercion. And God says true submission works through a self-denial. All right, let's go on then. What is healthy submission? We looked at Jesus Christ. He is our supreme model what it looks like to submit. Go on. From Luke chapter 2, Jesus has to leave the temple there. He's been discussing things with the doctors of the law. And he went down with them and came. His mother and father didn't know he wasn't there, earthly parents. And uh, they go back. They don't find Jesus amongst the caravan. And the people headed back up to Nazareth, coming out of Jerusalem. But forget how many hours bus drive it is when you leave Jerusalem to go back up to Nazareth. But anyway, they're, they're in a caravan. And they, they're there, and Jesus isn't there. So they go back, and they find Jesus sitting there, talking. I mean, you know, with, the, with these folks. And so he, he, he responds. And he says, hey, his mother said, you know, we've been looking. He said, don't you know, I, I'm in my father's house. This is, this is why I'm here. This is, what, you know, hey, be about my father's business. He went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. Same word, hupotasso, arrange yourself under. The word hupo is the word, a preposition meaning under. Tasso means to arrange. Arrange myself under. Who? God the Father. And people that he was responsible for creating. They didn't know more than him. They weren't more powerful than he was. They were sinful people. But he went home and became submissive to them. He stayed in his place in order as a child. He submitted to him. He brought himself underneath him. All right? And, and his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus, notice this, we tried to point this out several times last week. Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor. The word stature means maturity. So Jesus increased in wisdom, stature, and in favor with God and man. After he went home and submitted to them. Sometimes the assumption is, is when we submit, we're going to decrease. Something's going to be withheld from us. We're not going to have the opportunities that we want. We're not going to get the breaks that we want uh, if we submit. Exact opposite. Healthy submission to the right people that God has ordered in your life, Jesus shows us, leads to increase. There's a, if I stay in this church, I'm going to die. 
If I hang out here, I ain't gonna ever get where God's trying to take me. Might be true if God didn't call you here. But if God called you here, there's gonna be an increase in wisdom, an increase in stature or maturity, and an increase in favor. God's gonna give influence on your behalf. You'll find that sitting up in here, you might end up sitting next to somebody with all these empty chairs that the Spirit of God has brought into relationship with you that God will use to be a part of helping to open so many doors you haven't even begun to think what it's going to do. I've sat on planes and had that kind of thing happen to me. All, 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 ki all kinds of stuff. Down to the very schedule of what plane I got on and the seat I sat in. This is, this is, this is amazing stuff. See, we're, the, the flesh is so busy trying to create its own way and trying to run God. Yeah, I said it, trying to run God. God, God doesn't need, Jonathan saw it with David. He said, hey, whether by many or by few, we ain't got to be the whole army. What we got to have is God, right? We have to have God to do what we've been called to do. And if God is with us, we can do it. Come on, bro, let's go. This, this, is, this is the way, you know, and, and I, you know, I have to be, be a little bit more transparent with you. This is, this is really spoken to my life over the years because I've, I've understood, the Lord's helped me to understand, really. He's helped me understand Woo! that there, there, are, there were points of depression and confusion, even anger and disgust and all that in, in reference to my life and to our ministry and things that we, and just no matter how hard we work, no how much we fasted and prayed, no matter how many ideas, no matter how many things we did, God said do, get in the closet and speak and get counsel and bring it out and work it out, just didn't work. And the older you get, the less time you have to get done what you believe God's called you to do. So it got frustrating. It gets very frustrating. And, uh, you know, from time to time, folks, have you tried? Have you done? Have you thought about? And, you know, so far, most of it we have tried and thought about and done. But we haven't excelled in the way that I sense from God that he wants us to. But the, the, the place to be is in the place of submission. Not in running all over the country trying to get somebody to prophesy over me about what he's going to do with me and Metro Christian Worship Center. Just get in line and get somebody to prophesy on me. I mean, I, I've had so many prophecies, so I, I don't even remember half of them. To be honest with you. Okay, I'll talk on this side. All right. <laughs> what, what's up with that? Understanding that my, or in your case, if this is you, our personal value does not depend upon the obedience of people. Well done will be heard in light of all of the factors. Glory to God. I love you. Good preaching, Pastor Ray. Good preaching. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I, I'm not sure if I really believe that for a long time. But uh, I'm starting to believe it. I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't shamming on what God really wanted me to do. But you, you, can't, you can't make nobody do the will of God as you see it, okay? Because sometimes what you see really ain't God. Oh Lord, help me Jesus. I'm getting in all kinds of trouble today. All right. Jesus, perfect example. He submitted to a man and a woman that he created. <laughs> he was responsible for the procreation process. He's Lord over all of it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him, not anything was made that was made. He was there. And now he's expected to go submit to people he created. And when he did it, he increased. Who are you looking for to help you blow up? 
Huh? Who are you looking for? I mean, just open this thing up so that you can just pull out full throttle and go all out for what God really created you to be. Hopefully it's the people that God has put in your life. And you may have been in some way responsible. You didn't create them, I didn't create them, but you may be responsible to a certain degree for whatever measure of success they might be having right now in their life. But God still expects you to submit if he calls you into that kind of relationship with him. This is very hard. And because it's so, so difficult, uh, many times we miss it because what's really hard about it is our flesh doesn't like this. Our flesh keeps telling us that in order for us to get where we need to be, we got to be Lord. No, we don't tell ourselves that. We're Christians. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. We sing those beautiful songs. And then when we live, I'm the Lord. I call the shot. I don't really, I don't really sense that it's from the Lord. I, I don't really think that's God for me to go home with you. I'm about my father's business. Come on, let's take it home. He wasn't going to increase in wisdom and favor and knowledge by sitting up there talking to the doctors of the law. He wasn't going to grow like that by being under just the scholars. It's part of the package, part of the deal, but the way it was going to happen, you're going to go home and you're going to be a child. And you're going to submit to your earthly father that I signed in your earthly mama that I gave you. That process is the process God set out for him increasing. Ooh, Lord. I just, if I can get to enough of the seminaries and enough of the universities and enough of the, the big wig, you know, and I know this sounds like I'm a hater. I'm not a hater. I admire a lot of these people. If I can, if I can just, if I can just get around in and sit around them and suck up what they've learned, God might direct a few that way. But I'm telling you, the most of the time, you're gonna have to go home and live within the context of the people and the relationships that He called you to. You submit there, uh, and the Scripture says He submitted. He was submissive to them. Yes, he was submissive to God the Father. But do you know how we express our submission to God the Father? One of the ways we express our submission to God the Father is by crying and saying yes to God in, 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 in a time of prayer or the study of the Word of God or certain matters that we're dealing with. But another way is through the people that he put in our lives. It's not all, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do as I'm over here in a cave fasting for three weeks. That's one dimension of submitting to God. Here's the tougher one. Every day, ain't on no fast, yielding to God under the leadership that he put in your life or the relationships that he put in your life. There, 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 there is an increase in wisdom and stature and favor that comes when we do that. That does not come. We can lay up in a room for the rest of our life. It will not happen that way. It's going to happen as we walk out the relationship that he called us to walk out in the roles that he gave us in that context. And that's difficult because sometimes, let's be honest, Jesus, it, it's, this wasn't, this wasn't Jesus' issue or problem. But for, for many of us, we don't really think you know, whoever it is that God may have put in your life, they really got what it takes to take me where I got to go. We don't. We, we think it's who we think it ought to be and in the way it ought to be and with whom we pick in order for it to be that way. And God just twiddles his thumbs and wait until we wake up because he ain't made no mistake about the people, the place, the time, the relation. None of that is messed up by God. There's, there's a certain dimension of wisdom you ain't going to walk in just because you're crying out to God. Uh, I'm, it, this is tough to preach. I've lived it. 
I've lived it. God will require of you that you, that you take off the labels and the valuation system and the grading system because you have misgraded certain people in certain relationships, thinking that if you could get with certain people in certain relationships, you're going to get to the wisdom and the, the increase and the wisdom and the stature and, and the favor stuff. If you hooked up with the right people at the right place at the right time, to do what? No, that's, that sounds facetious and it sounds... Like, I don't care. I don't mean it that way. But I mean, ask the question, to do what? Your will or his? Whose will are we talking about here? Whose picture are we talking about here? Mine? You know, I... You know, I If, the, if there's been a se severe area of discipline in my life, it's been this. Whose picture are you trying to build, right? Yours or mine? You don't get to pick. Pick a pastor, pick a ministry, pick a movement. Read your Bible. Just do a casual reading of it. How many people picked? Moses didn't even want to do it. Abraham didn't even know God was thinking of him like that. He wasn't sitting down, someday I'm going to be the father of many nations. I'm going to be the father of many nations. Um. He wasn't doing that. Esther wasn't sitting down, someday I'm going to be married to the emperor of the world. And here's what I'm going to do. No, some guys came in town. Persians came in town and snatched her up along with a whole lot of other young girls. Let me act like we sit down here in some kind of build your life class and all we got to do is write down what we're going to be and where we're going to go and work hard enough and get enough money and enough contacts, enough people together and we'll get there. And then we beg God for the rest of the 30, 40 years to increase us. He said, you're with the wrong people. You're in the wrong situation. You, you manipulated your way out of what I was trying to do with you. I know. I'm telling you, it's, you know, this it's ain't always that easy to say or hear. But this is the real deal. Real deal. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm at the age now, I don't care what nobody thinks. I really don't. <laughs> I, I, I've been in that little silly game, that little fame game stuff. Yeah, you know, I didn't think I was in it when the Lord told me to get out of it. I, told, I said, Lord, I'm, that's not what I'm doing. I had tears in my eyes. He said, who's God, me or you? Get out of the fame game. Yeah, I didn't even know I was in it. And then when he started showing stuff to me, I thought, oh yeah, I am in it, ain't I? Here's how I knew I was in it. I didn't want to be famous, but I wanted to be around the people that were because they could help me. Like God needed famous people to help me. You know, God, God can't do nothing through nobody that's not famous to help you. Can he? Oh, Lord. Oh, let's see how much time I got. All right, okay. Yeah, see, <laughs> why, why, why is this... Let me go deeper. Some, some of this is really about the inward and innate desire that we have as a result of being created and made in the image and likeness of God. We were created to subdue. Being fruitful is in us. Multiplying and increasing is in our very DNA. Taking dominion is in us. Said in today's language, being successful is in us. That's 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 what we that's what we crave. You know. Why? We're created and made in the image and likeness of God. He can't help it, neither can we. One problem. S I N. 
sin infects and sin affects that longing and that yearning for being fruitful, multiplying, increasing. It messes with us bad. So God is no longer in the driver's seat. We get in the driver's seat for doing it, even as Christians. So, it's, you know, God, God, God doles out the places that he wants us to be and do and to spend our life. And in our minds, over here in Atlanta is success. success. Okay? But Natchez, Mississippi, that's where you go when you're trying to get started so you can get to Atlanta. So if you get, if you get told Natchez, and, and it ain't ever gonna be nothing but Natchez, you're hurt. Because in your mind, Atlanta is the will of God for me. London is the will of God for me. Not some little hilly place way out from London. Tokyo is the place where God wants me. I'll pay any price to get to Tokyo. No, God says, you know, St. Louis. Submitted, increased, submitted, increased. Could it be that one of the reasons why things haven't gotten where you even know God told you he wants to take you? Nothing wrong with it being in Atlanta if that's really where God sent you, okay? Nothing wrong with that, please. Pastor, I'm not trying to say, is nothing wrong with it. If that's what God is saying. Uh, when you study scripture, though, you'll find that, that uh, most people don't know where they're going, and they don't know where they're going to end up. The guy who wrote this letter wasn't even trying to get to Philippi. It wasn't even on his list. He wasn't going to Philippi. Scripture says he tried to go one place, and the Holy Spirit said, No. Then he tried to set sail for another place and the Spirit of God forbade him to go there. This place wasn't even on his list. God had to show him a man dressed like a person from Macedonia to even get his attention about where he wanted to take it. And he submitted. He submitted. Let's go on, okay. I have to skip this one. Jesus did it when he went to the cross. The Bible says, taking the form of a bondservant, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Let this same mindset be in you and me. See, this is what, tr this is what true healthy submission is. Healthy submission is the mindset of Jesus about being obedient to the Father and submitting to the Father. That, that, that's, that's all there is. Place, people that know you, folks that don't know you, people that applaud you, people that don't applaud you, it has its impact. I'm not gonna act like it doesn't, but the truth of the matter is, at the end of the day, with God, well done goes to people that were obedient. Whether it's Natchez or Atlanta, you can get to Atlanta and be disobedient. So it's not an automatic well done just because you end up in Atlanta and you blow up in Atlanta or St. Louis, or New York, or L.A. Who am I talking to today? Lord, help me today. All right, next verse, please. See, this word obedient, as we talked about, hupakuo, means to hear other, literally acting under the authority of the one speaking. Acting under the authority of the one speaking, and it implies really listening with a readiness to execute or obey what is requested or ordered. Do you, do you know what that's like to be ready to, to execute? In the military, I wasn't in the military, but then it talked to different ones where, you know, readiness is really important. Do you know it's not just ability? It's not even just willingness. Readiness. 
readiness. Are you prepared for this? Do you, do you see the time? Do you understand? Hupako is, I'm hearing, as one who's under the authority. Uh, now, all this has to be taken in, in balance and because there, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of this that just gets blown out of, out of proportion. No human being, myself, anybody, has the authority over you that God has over you. Never, never confuse me or any other leader as the person that you have to please in order to please God. Uh, no, 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 absolutely not. Absolutely not. Mm. Got two little boys here years and years ago when they first came here. Uh, one of them looked at his mom and said, well, I was back, I was up here preaching the ministry and stuff, said, and when, she, when they came back to church, she told the mama, that's Jesus. So when I got to him, I said, no, son, no, no, no. No, Pastor Ray ain't Jesus. I'm a long way from Jesus. But it did make me feel good that you thought about him when you, <laughs> when you saw me. Yeah, but th this, 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 is, this, is the, this is the key here, that we, we understand. Now, you know, this is a role that God has given, and it's great, but I'm a man. And if I clown, God will just get another man. Right. Hallelujah. When the time comes for me to sleep in death, He'll get somebody else. Thank you, Jesus. So, but Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will always be here. There is none like unto him. So when we're listening, we're listening to him together under his authority. God does everything decently and in order. He has, he has an ordered he has ordered relationships in the home, ordered relationships for the local church, ordered relationships in, in the work, workplace, ordered relationships in education, ordered relationships in, in, the, in the realm of government. Ordered, he has them. And, and he says what they ought to be. Study the scriptures and we, we can see something. But in all of those ordered relationships, it's important that we still connect the person who's operating in that authority as being individuals who are under authority. Whether they know it or not, they're ultimately under God's authority. And God takes the responsibility to make sure that every person who is under authority and has someone else under their authority, he makes sure that those individuals are protected. Especially when one of those under authority people act like they are the one that's in authority like God. He will protect you. Okay, now, I, I don't just put this up here uh, to impress you with, with, with my knowledge of New Testament Greek, because it, it, it ain't that much, okay? But, but this is important to see, because this is the meaning of the word when he says that he was obedient. Jesus was obedient. Healthy submission ultimately gets expressed in obedience to God, not just obedience to my dream, not just obedience to my thirst, not just obedience to my pain, not just obedience to my fears, not just obedience to my friends, not obedience just to my culture. Mm -mm. Obedience to the Lord. See, because when, when the bullets go to flying and the blows get swung and, and several of them connect with your face or your chest, you need to know that you did what you did because you were being obedient to the Lord. And that the Lord called for this and endorsed this. It wasn't long as I began to travel around in ministry in the country and then also outside of the nation that I, I began to see, man, we, we need, I couldn't be everywhere. It was hard. It was hard for me. You walk the streets, not only in Africa, but in India and other parts of the world. Walk them. Live in some of the villages where I had to live, or uh, the little towns, rather, where I had to live. And no floors, everything dirt. People working from sun up to sun down. Little churches with very little anything at all. Outhouses for restrooms. And I could only be there, and I couldn't be. I couldn't be. I, I got overwhelmed. 
I got overwhelmed. Millions and millions of people in India. Millions of them. Ha, ha, what's my place? See, because that's where I have authority to operate. The authority is not my feeling about where I ought to be. It's not my feeling about uh, the, 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 <laughs> the pain emotionally and physically and everything else that I experienced when I was in some places. That's not my authority. My authority to go back is not, I hurt so bad because of what I saw and I want to help. That's not my authority. That's how I feel about it. God is the one who's in authority. And he plants us where he wants us to be planted. To serve there. I, if you, I could call the woman's name, but I won't. Back in the 80s and 90s, she was very popular and, and, uh, and so forth, ministry. And she had a daughter when she experienced something like that. It almost made her lose her faith. She turned it on God. How could you love the world and all of this pain is going on in the world? Working sun up to sun down on the mission field herself. What do you do? See, I, I don't know who I'm helping with this. What, 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 what do you do? You listen to the voice that's over you. The voice of the Lord the leadership he's placed in your life. Hmm? And wait for the witness of the Spirit of God and serve there. And uh, from time to time, the, the Lord would call me out of here and send me other places. You know, slept on the floor, everything else. You know, it was an honor to me. It really was. It really was an honor. I remember time, I don't know how I got on this. First time, first time I went to uh, overseas to stay an extended period of time, I was planning to write home and tell my parents I wasn't coming back. I mean, there was so much, and I didn't care about being famous. I wanted to be obedient to God. And a week or two before, before we, the team was preparing to come back home, the Lord gave me a dream, and in the dream, he spoke to me and said, go home, go back to America. I mean, I was ready to write at this. I, was, I love y'all, and I'll see y'all, maybe. <laughs> if I don't see you on this side, I'll see you. I mean, that's where my heart was. God said, wrong place. What are you going to do? That's on me. Go home. Yeah, I, I, you know, I know. It's obedient. Even to the point of what? Death. We all know what that means. The physical death that Jesus went through, the way he died. You know, you know the way they, they executed Jesus? You know who got that form of execution? Rapists. Murderers, kidnappers, hmm? that's who got that. So even when he died, he, he, he wouldn't have the distinction of dying as the son of glory. I'm doing this for you. No, 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 no. When he died, they was yelling and fussing. If you the king, if you God, get off the cross. That was the atmosphere. It wasn't, oh, you know, like we see in some of these movies, oh, oh, oh. They were jeering at him. Have you ever paid the ultimate price with people jeering at you? They don't even know it's for them that you're doing it. And the few that find out don't even care. Even to the point of death. Death to the will of the flesh. 
death to the way it ought to look. Death to the people that ought to be appreciating what I'm doing. Death, see, death. I ain't got to have none of that follow through on what God called me to do. Die to it. I'm under authority. I submit. It's the will of God. They'll see it later. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They knew what they were doing. They wouldn't be saying this. Forgive them. Submission. See, that, that's healthy submission. Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. Now, these Romans, they're just doing what they, hey. And the ones yelling and screaming, and they don't know no better. To your hands, I commend my spirit. You got it. I understand. Tetelestai. Finished. On point. Spot on. Done. With my crew weeping and the majority of people not even knowing what they're doing. Gotta be, but you, you know the level of appreciation and praise and commendation that we need in order to sell out, in order to give God our all. It's a travesty. That's why so little gets done. Because we're still living on a stage in our minds. The video camera's still running. Every move is being watched for our fans. What happens when you have no fans, but you're expected to die? I mean, back up earlier in the week, he's overlooking the city of Jerusalem and he's weeping because they don't get it. This is the time of your visitation. You're in a Kairos moment and you've missed the very thing that 15 centuries was supposed to prepare you for. He weeps over them and he prays over them. And he gets up and he moves right in obedience to the will of the Father. Not even the apostles and they're sleeping and they're missing, misfiring on what's really going. None of that, their misinterpretation of what's going. He, he, he goes right on into the will of the Father to the point of death. Okay. Until you're willing to die, it's probably not going to happen. The way God intends for it to happen. I mean, die in those kind of circumstances where the very reasons why you're doing it are not appreciated. They're not respected. They're not honored. And you don't meet the deadlines and the expectations of the folks who really think that you ought to be doing it a certain way. See, and because we're, we're so we're so we're so uh, we're so cuddly, and, and it's always got to be a bunch of stuff. Nothing wrong with affection, but you know what I'm saying. I mean, it's just we don't we don't have ten thousand pounds of sugar along the way. There's no way in the world we can do it. We can't do it. Got to be hugs and kisses all the way, all the way. Folks standing and cheering, come on, come on, come on, come on, you can do this, come on, come on. Come on. And so the enemy, he already knows, he ain't got a fool with some of us because he knows good and well. All he got to do is make sure we ain't got enough cuddles and we ain't got enough people kissing us. And he, he, ain't, got to, he ain't got to worry, he ain't got to worry, he ain't got to worry about us praying, fasting, nothing, because we didn't get the cuddles. When we get the cuddles and we get the hugs, and, and we get blasted, you know, and we get the, we get the followers. Oh, yes, all for you, Jesus, with my 10,000 followers. But as long as there's no followers, he knows. He not, he send an assassin for us. He doesn't, we're doing more damage by being mediocre than taking us out. He takes us out. No, he loses. The devil loses some of his influence. Uh, he knows, man. They're going to talk. 
And the ones who are doing it are going to fuss about the people who ain't doing it. So we got all this junk up in the church. See, if you ain't doing it like me, you really ain't serious. I'm going to sit here and wait and grade how you do it. Because I know I've been with God. And the Lord has used me on several occasions. So I'm here to be your mentor. I'm here to make sure that you understand how it ought to be done. It stinks. Nasty, prideful attitude. Stinks. You know, it don't make no difference. So the devil just says, hey. You ain't got to take none of them out. Just let them keep doing what they do. And the church ain't going to do nothing in South St. Louis. And just show up and listen to that long-winded preacher. Preach! And go home. And tell them how you ought to do it next time. Hmm? Yeah. But when you're under, you move with what God says to. And He's been patient with all of us, hasn't He? Yeah, He's been patient with all of us. He's loved us. He's loved us through it, through the, through the stench, through it all, through the stargazing, through the fame chasing, through all of it. He's He's loved us through it, and He calls us to love others in the same way. Uh, I'm going to stop. This This is the connection. See. This is the connection between submission and loving excellently. People who love excellently, excellently are motivated. They're motivated out of the love of God. See? But that, that's, that's really... That's what he called us for. That's why we're here. That's really uh, the purpose of the Lord for our lives. I'm, I'm gonna jump down here and I'm gonna call, call out the number for you real quick and I'm gonna end with this. And have to read them. Go to slide number 36, would you will please? Slide number 36. Here's, here's, here's some traits you can look for based upon this passage and some others, ton of others that you can study, we sent the PowerPoint to you, but I want to end with this. Go back, please, to, I think, to number one. Yeah. One of the first submission traits that you want to look for is that placing yourself at the complete disposal of another person is a voluntary decision and attitude. It's not involuntary. It's not forced. When it's forced, it's probably not real. We humble ourselves before the Lord. The Lord doesn't humble us. Oh, he can knock us down and everything else, but no, no. Because humility is a, is a, is a heart thing. I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm... Remember that from last week? I'm standing up on the inside. Yeah. So it's voluntary. Number two, real quick, real quick. Submission takes place in the nature of God. It's in the Lord, out of reverence for the Lord. It's, it, it's, it's, it's a response in the Lord. So it's by the agency of the Spirit, and it's in the nature of God himself. It's not contrary, it's not contrary to the nature of the Lord to be submissive. All right, let's go on. Go, we see that in Jesus. Number three, it's unto the Lord. That means we're engaging for God's glory and for our good. When you, see, when you see that, that's the dominant thing. It's not, I'm submitting. Can't you see I'm submitting? Bring me glory. See, see how humble I am? Glorify me. Worship me. Praise me. Don't you, see how, don't you see how humble I am? I'm your pastor. I'm an humble man. I, I could go back in the day before I knew God and I can show you how I used to be. Don't you know how I am now? 
See? Glorify me. No, 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 no. It's unto the Lord. It's engaged for God's glory. I submit for God's glory. For our good. Whether you know how much I did or not, doesn't matter. You don't have to know. It's out of reverence for Christ. Submit one to another. We missed that scripture 5, Ephesians 5. Out of reverence for Christ. Fourth, another tra healthy trait. It's motivated by the love of God. True submission is always motivated out of the love of God. What's best for God? What's best for these individuals? What is the ultimate good that God is trying to bring about in their life? And so whatever I must do in taking the low road, which is really what submission includes as well, and being obedient to death, do it. God will get the glory. His love will be made known. Number five, it's guided by the word of God. This is a very important one because oftentimes uh, we can sacrifice and give our bodies to be burned and it not be out of the love of God that we're giving our bodies to be burned. That's what, that's what Paul taught, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Though I give my body to be burned and it not be as a result of agape, it counts me nothing. It means nothing. Now, most of us would think, if I'm giving my body to be burned, the only way I would do that is because I love you. No, it's possible to make really, really great sacrifices and it not be in obedience to God. Saul had all of these sheep and goats and stuff saved and God's word to him, a direction was, kill everything. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Mm -hmm. To obey, to obey. You will never really be obedient to God without an involving sacrifice, but you can make sacrifices and not be in obedience to God. Be in obedience to your own will, your own desire, your own plan. And believe, the Holy Spirit is the only one that can show us that. You know, when people tell me stuff like that, sometimes I go, you don't know me. You don't know what I did, huh? I had the same look on my face as some of y'all got right now. Like, huh? What are you talking about? I wouldn't even be doing this unless it was for God. Really? Then why are you depressed? Why are you dragging your feet? Why are you belittling yourself or belittling what God is doing? Why are you running helter-skelter? Why are you worried and shaking and twisting and jerking at night? Why can't you sleep? Hmm? Why are you anxious? Why are you worried about tomorrow? I mean, if, if it was really done out of the love of God, you'd battle some of those things, but you'd win them. Yeah. So it's guided by, by the word of God. It's guided by the word of God. Okay, go on. So when we see those traits at others, here's some of the fruit of healthy submission to wise shepherding that will take place in you in my life. I won't be able to go into it. But here's some, number one, we begin to see, learn, and receive, and live in the love of the Father for us individually. Individually. Not just God loving this mass group of people. Millions and billions and billions of us. He does, but we begin, we begin to see in submission, in, in the experiential dimension of submission, we begin to see and learn and receive and live in the love of the Father for us individually. Among other things, it helps us not to, to, to try to pursue things and create things to do for God. That's, that's not always love either. That's us craving a sense of completion and a sense of accomplishment. The last place to get, well, one of the last places you want to get involved in is ministry if you're really, really hungry, 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 and need a lot of attention and affirmation about your worth. Because it will never be enough. No, it never will be. Okay, I'll go on. But we begin to see and learn and receive and live in the love of the Father for us individually. Number two. 
another fruit out of submission to God, submitting to wise shepherding. In relationship now, we're exposed to and partake of all that is necessary for us to be whole and fulfilled individuals living intimately with God. God's enough. And his enoughness gets channeled through other people in community, but he's enough. Years ago, I was on a fast and God, you know, I forget what week it was, and God wasn't saying nothing, and I didn't know nothing else to say, and, and I had read and studied and prayed and, 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 until, until all of my anxiety just reached a peak and just kind of petered out, just, and, and that took some days. It took some days for that to happen for me, okay? And when it finally just tuppered out, and I couldn't think of nothing else to say to God, nothing else to believe him for, and, and nothing else to claim, and nothing. And there was far more that I still needed to know, but, but I just, I, and then I started getting bored on the fast. And I was tired. And God wasn't saying nothing. And he wasn't releasing me from the fast. So I'm just there, me and him, me and God. Why am I not enough? You know, he was asking me, Dad, can I start some conversations sometimes? Can it be about my list? and not yours? Can it really be about me, Ray? What's wrong with me? Just being with me. For me. Not for your ministry. Not for success. Not for breakthroughs. Me. Just here to be with me. Not a machine that you get money out of. Not a bottle that you shake enough to get what you want. Me. We're exposed to and partake of all that is necessary for us to be whole. And our wholeness is often put on hold because we think it's coming from somewhere else. Submit to him in the moment, in this space, with all the stuff that hasn't been done yet, all the unfulfilled promises of God, that's how they died, the scripture says in Hebrews 11. They died trusting that it was coming, even though it wasn't here now. It's coming. And that's all I need to know. Yeah, number three. Another fruit of healthy submission to wise. God causes us to live maturely and walk in the fullness of Christ. I can't go there, go on. The Lord prepares and motivates us to live by faith and walk out the eternal purpose and mission God has for us, for us, for us, for us. That's written on purpose, not just for me, what God has for us, us. Me and Brenda, me and my kids, us. Us, not just Ray, us. Submission to wise shepherding brings us into an understanding of us-ness. What God has called us to do. And we begin to see the value God has placed on us. 
us. Us. Not just me, us. Next one. Only got two more, I think. God helps us to personally cooperate with him and his will in the lives of family. This, this us and this stuff and friends and coworkers and neighbors and classmates because it's not just about me. You know why I moved this over here? I'm not the center. Others can, fine, but I'm doing this for a while. It's his word. So it's not just about me. God helps us. When, we, when, we're, when there's healthy submission to wise shepherding, God helps us personally cooperate with him. Cooperate with him and his will in the lives of family and friends and coworkers and neighbors and classmates. Go ahead. When there's fruitful, healthy submission to the Lord, the fruit of it, Here's the last one. The Lord helps us become his loving, compelling, and effective witnesses. In community, we begin to share, we begin to minister, we begin to walk, and walk out together the will of God. And no big eyes and little U's. We serve God. Final scripture as we close today. Next slide real quick. Thank you, Father God. Bless you. Okay, I sent you the wrong one. We'll pick it up next time. Father, your word is very clear. And your meaning sometimes unravels us. And at times it really is, can be disturbing. But in our hearts, we know that everything you're doing, you're doing because you love us. Your purpose for us is to walk in a way that truly honors you, blesses you. You're the, only, you're the only one that can command that kind of motive and still be pure in your intent. As we say yes to you, as we submit to you, we thank you for the increase. We thank you for all that you're doing in us that helps us to become more Christ-like. As we yield to you in your sanctification process, our hearts are open in a fresh and a wonderful and a powerful way. We long for you, God. The last... 80 or 90 minutes that we've been in this place the last the last 80 or 90 minutes that we've been in this particular part of this service the spirit of God has put his finger on some things that are really essential and submission is the key to the outworking of what God desires to do. You see, the purpose of the truth is not to crush us and to beat us up. The purpose of God sending the truth, among other reasons, is to sanctify us. The one thing that God is at work at doing in our life is conforming us to the image of his son. Today we've seen a number of attributes that are in his son. Watch this carefully, that he wants us to submit to him about so that he can work it into us. There's a thought process involved. There are some emotional things that are involved. And then all of our wills are involved. And so as God is, is working, he's sending the truth not merely to be intellectual with us, but to help us to understand the way he sees it. And that he really desperately, in a sense, we put that in human terms, uh, 
Uh, let me just say it this way. God really longs for this kind of understanding to be a part of what we do and why we do what we do. So as we close this morning, or this afternoon now, it's 1231. As we close, I, I want to invite you and in some ways challenge, maybe even for a few of you, you may feel like you're being prodded to respond to what the Holy Spirit has, has said to you personally as you've been listening. Knowing that God is, he's answering your prayer. What was that prayer? Lord, I want to be all that you want me to be. That's not magically done, you know. That's one yes at a time. Yes to the will of God. Yes to the will of God. For most of us in this room, it, it really does get back to that appetite thing. Maybe it's not sex, drugs, or money hungry. It's something as simple as God's will, my way. God's will, my way. Not God's will, God's way. God's will, my way. So let's pray again and we're going to go. Lord, as you've dealt with us in this room, every one of us, we sense you calling us to master our belly, the longings and the yearnings of our belly. It's the killer every time to submission. We crave and long and yearn, not only for your approval, for fellowship it's the one thing Lord that is like air we must have it we've been feeding at so many different places fellowshipping with so many different kinds of meals that have been tainted we choose in this moment to come to you again the fountain of living waters and we yield our hearts to you. Thank you for your, your grace and for your patience, your loving kindness with us. My soul says yes. I pray, Lord, that everyone who feels trapped feel stuck that you by your spirit we break the fetters as we say yes to you ultimately Lord we're aware we are not only because of our decisions but in your sovereign wisdom You've not allowed more mobility. You've not allowed increase. For you yet await our connection with the fact that you are Lord over us and over it all. So, my God, my God, my God, my God. Yes to the will of God. Yes to the will of God. If you have never um, I'll just say it this way if you find yourself in this place and you have not yet surrendered to what God has really been speaking to your heart and there, there are a number of things on my way to in for the service this morning I, I, I sense that there will be a multiplicity of and I didn't understand it at the time like I do now but I sense that there would be a multiplicity of reasons for responding to the word of the Lord today. 
And without trying to figure out what all of those reasons are, I, I just sense by the Spirit that, that God has summoned all of us individually for different reasons to a level of submission that we have not yet reached. And, and so he calls upon us. He's not here to beat us about it, but he is here to command it of us. You know why? That's the only road. That's the only way to the fulfillment that God wants, not only in your life, but the ministry he wants through you in the lives of others. And so as we prepare to leave right there as you are seated, would you just take a minute and whatever those reasons are in your own heart, while he's playing, continue that please, I surrender all. Uh, just, just interface with the Lord right where you are, just right where you are. God, I hear you. I hear you, God. And I choose your way. take the grace to master my belly I take the grace to follow you blessed be the name of the Lord my God Would you stand, please? Somebody is standing near you. Old school used to say, say to your neighbor. But instead of saying neighbor, just, if you can, divulge a little bit of what the Lord just dealt with you about. Just say it to them. God was dealing with me about, and fill in the blank, and here's what my response is to the Lord. Just turn to him right now and say it. While they're talking, if you're here in this room or you're watching still, it's about 1240 our time. If you're still here and you've never opened up your life to Jesus, you've never been born again, maybe that is the thing God's dealing with you about. You've never given your life to Christ. You've never been saved. Today is the day you need to do it. He loves you. He wants a personal relationship with you based on his terms. It's not just a relationship that says to God, Here's what I bring to you. I'll do my best. He wants more than that. He wants to be in you. And he wants you living in him. And if you desire that, if you see the need for that, here's what God says. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you will be rescued, you will be saved. For God loved the world so that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish or be ruined, but have everlasting life. The next verse is very important. 
for God did not send his son into the world to condemn us but that the world might be rescued or saved through him and so while others are talking around you maybe even in your home if you're in that category where you realize you need to be rescued not just from bad things happening in your life but rescued from the very thing that could cause you to have to live eternally without God he wants you to say yes I'd be happy to lead you in a prayer in which you express your faith and your confidence in Jesus if you want to do that just say after me Lord I've heard your word and I believe it you sent Jesus to die on the cross for my sinful heart and to deal with every single thing that comes as a result of being a sinner I need you you're my only salvation so I surrender my life to you you are Lord come and live in me I say yes thank you for hearing my prayer and thank you for coming to live in me I'm yours I'm yours and father for others who pray today maybe not in this room but I ask that you would continue to minister to them and if you'll give us an opportunity we'd love to be a part of your life to do our part in helping you to know the Lord better and to grow there's a number on some of your screens that you will see and uh, you can just text that number and just write the word saved there let us know leave your name and a way of contacting you and we will get in contact with you so important we welcome you into the family of God if you're in this room and you did that feel free after the service today to let us know downstairs in our welcome center as you're leaving there's a little area to the side there will be folks there that'll be very very happy to to talk with you and to pray with you more it's a little quieter a little more private we'd love to be able to meet with you there well the Lord bless you the Lord give you his strength and the Lord help you to move forward in his will this week look forward to having great time in the presence of the Lord all of next month next Sunday starts our Metro Family Fest on Sundays and Fridays and even Wednesdays there'll be something going on we got a couple of special events that Elder Marshall told us about that's also happening I want to encourage you to be a part of that and God bless you We've got other speakers that'll be in from within Metro that'll be up every Sunday so Pastor Ray won't be up for the next four or five Sundays but I want you to know God's going to speak to us in a very special way and I look forward to God helping us to be who he wants us to be God bless the Lord bless and keep you go in the name of the Lord Jesus everybody welcome Joe will you praise God my our son is here and out of town bless you all